Our last speaker of the day is Vijay Menon from Google. And he will be talking about scalable multiprocessor programming via transactional memory. And he's been, before being at Google, he was at Cornell and the University of California, Berkeley, and Intel. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'll be giving a, a general overview of uh, transactional memory, um, an interesting technology that's kind of popped in lots of interesting places, like uh, Chapel, for, for instance, as uh, Brad mentioned earlier today. So um, a lot of the talks today have focused on this notion of scalability over large-scale distributed systems. Um, but scalability is really not just limited to those systems anymore. Um, modern multiprocessors, or modern processors now have multiple cores. And uh, this is just a natural result of the power and performance challenges that hardware architects are facing today. And uh, the current trend suggests that we're going to get yet more and more cores on, uh, on a given die. Um, so scalability is really not just about servers, but now also about what, uh, you know, what we, we generally consider as clients, desktops, laptops like this one, and, and even increasingly, I think we're going to see mobile devices with multiple cores on them. So good performance on these, uh, these systems is now going to require that we, we be able to write uh, scalable applications that really utilize multiple cores. So we need a way to program these systems, and there is a traditional uh, model that uh, has been out there uh, to use for, for these kind of uh, environments. And, and that's basically threads and locks. Uh, so the, the general idea is that we have multiple threads of execution. Uh, for example, one per, per every core that we have. Uh, we have some sort of shared memory to communicate between those cores. And we have locks to coordinate um, access for multiple threads to shared memory. Uh, great, except this is kind of difficult to program, as we all know, too. Um, in general, fine-grained locking is required if we want to have any kind of good scalability uh, over this kind of a model. Um, and, and that really puts a lot of burden on the programmer to avoid uh, fun stuff like deadlock uh, in order to maintain correct lock discipline to make sure they use the correct locks for uh, given data. And to also just compose different modules uh, together under locks is quite difficult. So um, an alternative that's uh, been proposed is something that's called transactional memory. And the idea here is to replace our locked regions in our programs with transactions. And uh, this is an idea that's been around quite a bit uh, in the database community. Uh, we saw it a couple talks ago. Thorsten talked about transactions in, over distributed hash map. And here, basically, what we want to do is transactions over memory. And, and really what transaction are, transactions are are a set of atomic operations that appear to execute sequentially. And when we apply this to memory, there's really two key ideas we want to take advantage of. Uh, the first is this notion of optimistic concurrency in the implementation. So although things appear to execute sequentially, we want to go ahead and try to e execute them uh, concurrently as much as we can get away with it and leave it up to the system to figure out how to make that uh, safe and correct. The other thing we really, we really like is declarative safety in the language. And um, here we want the programmer to really focus on what safety properties they want, rather than spend a lot of time figuring out how to get those safety properties, and leave it to the system to figure out how to do this efficiently. So here's a fancy little example. Um, let's suppose we have a shared document here, a shared bit of data here. And we have two threads on the left and the right that basically lock this data. This is Java code that's, let's imagine, locking the entire document and doing some operation. So under locks, if the, the thread on the left uh, proceeds, it's basically going to acquire the lock, and it's going to block the uh, code on the right from executing, and it's going to go ahead and do its operation. And only when it's done can the thread on the right go ahead and proceed and do its operation. Right. So they have to take turns in order to do this. So I said, as I said, with transactions, we'd like to take advantage of this notion of optimistic concurrency. We'd like to just go ahead and assume that um, we can just go ahead and do both of those operations in parallel. And notice I've kind of shown what this might look like in the language. We've replaced synchronized Java synchronized statement with this atomic statement. And we go ahead and do both simultaneously. In this case, everything's great. Now, of course, we don't just get this for free. There's a reason we call these atomic. And so it's up to the implementation to deal with Conflicts. So again, 
Here we have two threads, and now they're going to actually access the same location, write the same location. And again, we'd want to assume that we can do this uh, concurrently. And of course, if we just do this without checking, we'll, we're, we're going to have garbage, and uh, we'd like to avoid that um, to make this usable. So it's up to the system to figure out how to do this correctly, to figure out that, that, that something bad happened, and to make sure that we're left with a result that's consistent. So here we have bird, which is consistent with this transaction running before that transaction, and so we get a consistent final result. Okay. So here's a quick overview of the talk in general. Um, first, I'm going to talk about implementing atomic, uh, uh, I'm sorry, implementing optimistic concurrency, both in hardware and in software. And I'll talk later on about how to integrate transactions into programming languages and why you might want to do that. And then I'll conclude. So again, optimistic concurrency in transactions is, a, is a, an old idea. The key idea, as I said, is transactions should be performed in parallel. Um, we're taking this idea from databases, and now we're applying it to, to uh, random access memory. Um, so it's up to an implementation, again, to, to try to figure out how to make independent transactions to overlap. And to do that, the implementation has to detect and recover from conflicting accesses. Um, in order to, to basically recover from this, it's basically got to maintain the original and new versions of memory as, it's, as it computes its transaction. And the general idea is if there is no conflict, it's going to go ahead and commit its transaction when it's done and publish the new version all at once for other threads to see. Um, if there is a conflict, it's going to abort its transaction and go ahead and restore the original version and perhaps, depending on the semantics we want, restart the transaction uh, in order to make it actually happen. So the original idea of transactional memory actually uh, came up in, in a hardware context um, actually about 15 years ago now. So it's been around for a while. And the idea was actually quite simple. It was to leverage existing multiprocessor hardware mechanisms in order to give small scale transactions. And the idea was to use versioning. Uh, to, the idea was to get our versioning um, by using caches. So basically, a cache would uh, contain the new values, and main memory retains the original. So we can just uh, ex exploit caches to keep two copies of memory around in our transaction. Um, for conflict detection, we can just basically rely on extending uh, existing cache coherency mechanisms in order to do that. And the idea is, on a commit, the cached values are going to go ahead and be committed to main memory. But on abort, the cache values are simply dropped, and a processor has to bring back the old values from memory. Um, there's a lot of interesting work going on in hardware transactional memory. You know, it's been it's been some 15 years, but the state of ha uh, commercial hardware TM is still pretty modest. Um, the two examples, two best known examples, are Azul, a company that produces large-scale uh, Java-based servers. Uh, over four, uh, 500 cores, I think, they're recent machines, uses transactional memory under the hood. So they don't actually expose it to the programmer, but they use it as a, a way of actually more efficiently executing locks. Um, another uh, processor that's, that's actually just coming out is Sun's Rock processor, which is expected next year. And here, they're actually going to ex expose hardware transactional memory uh, to the programmer. But transactions are still pretty limited in size. Um, and allowable operations, you know, basically they're bounded by the hardware resources that you have, how big your cache is, for example. So if you want to run transactional memory operations today, well, there's software transactional memory. Um, and here the idea is to do all that necessary bookkeeping in software instead of using the cache, for example. And as you might expect, you're basically going to sacrifice raw performance that you'd get with the specialized hardware support. But you gain some flexibility. I mean, one important thing is you can actually run this on uh, existing machines, which is quite nice. Um, and you're also not bounded by hardware resources and limitations, so you could really support unbounded uh, transactions. Uh, you can also tailor and tune your algorithms for doing the bookkeeping for specific ap applications. And it does turn out that certain applications or certain application behavior uh, tends to like one sort of implementation of STM versus another. And as I'll talk a little bit later on, you can also support some more interesting language constructs and semantics that you might, might want to play around with. So to implement transactional memory, and I'm kind of focusing on software transactional memory here, but this applies to hardware too, um, you need to, as I said, 
implement conflict resolution. And there's really two basic strategies for this. Um, the first is uh, what I'd call eager, where a system basically assumes that there's a potential conflict and wants to prevent it ahead of time. And the basic idea here is to go ahead and acquire a lock underneath um, to prevent concurrent readers or writers, depending on what kind of operation you want to do. The, the other strategy is what I'd call lazy um, conflict resolution. And basically, the idea here is to assume no conflict and recover if necessary. And if you're doing a read or a write, what you're going to do, and I'll show an example of this in a moment, is basically record what you did or buffer what you did and validate that it's OK to go ahead and commit your transaction at the end, that re these reads and writes were correct. Um, hardware TMs are actually typically lazy, but STMs have the advantage of actually varying uh, significantly based on what kind of applications you want to do or what kind of characteristics you want. Uh, we also have this notion of versioning again, which we, you know, in, in the hardware case, we relied on cache. Um, again, there's really two ways of looking at this. One is this eager strategy, which assumes that a transaction will commit. And the general idea here is, you know, if I have a, a write inside of a transaction, I can just go ahead and write it directly to memory um, and record the old values in a log. And what I have to do here is that if I commit, I'm basically done. The writes have gone through to memory. But if I abort, I have to go ahead and pull those values from the logs and restore them back into main memory. And the other alternative is, is lazy, where we assume the transaction, there's a good chance that the transaction may abort. And here, again, in this case, we'd want to buffer the writes and not actually go ahead and write them to memory. But if we commit, only at that point do we go ahead and write in memory. On the other hand, in this case, if we abort, we just throw our buffer away. Right? So two kind of uh, opposite strategies there. So I'll talk about uh, a particular STM implementation, um, conveniently one that I actually worked on when I was at Intel. Uh, this, is a C, this is the McCarty STM. It's a C Java STM. Uh, described in a conference paper a couple years ago and is actually available on the web. Um, and it uses kind of a mixed strategy. For writes, it uses eager conflict resolution and eager versioning. And for reads, it uses lazy conflict detection. And again, I'm going to go through, walk through an example of uh, what that actually means. So first, um, in the hardware setting, we relied on the cache to help us do the bookkeeping. If we're implementing transactional memory in software, well, we need some data structures in order to do this. Um, and one set of data structures that we have are per data data structures. So this, there's this thing that we call a transaction record. And it's somewhat analogous to a lock. It protects some corresponding set of data. The difference, though, is it's not user visible. It's managed by the implementation. The, the programmer actually never sees the transaction record. It's up to the STM to automatically check and update uh, this record on any load and store. Um, a transaction record is usually implemented as a pointer size value. Uh, and it can, in, in the McCarty STM, it's in one of two states. It's an ex it can be in an exclusive state or a write state uh, where the value is a pointer to the owner of the transaction record. And only that owner can read or write to the data that's protected by the transaction record. Um, the second state is a shared state or a read state. And in this case, it's a version number. And in this case, every thread can go ahead and read the data, but they don't have permission to write the data. And we can distinguish between those two states just by taking advantage, advantage of the fact that pointers are usually aligned. So it's really just a matter of looking at the, the lower order bit. Uh, we just require that all version numbers be odd. And so just by checking the lower order bit, you can see if it's in a write state or a read state. We also do some bookkeeping per thread. Uh, we maintain a read set uh, on any uh, read operation. We're going to go ahead and update that read set. And I'll show an example of how that's built. And we also maintain a write set of the transaction records that, that we're trying to get a basically exclusive access to. And an undo set of values. Again, I said this is an eager versioning system of uh, values, original values uh, for locations that we go ahead and overwrite. So here's kind of what this might look like um, in an implementation. So uh, this is a kind of typical layout for a Java object or a C++ object. Uh, the first field is some sort of type descriptor that the system can use to figure out what type an object is. The second field is something that we're using for the STM, 
in our implementation here. It's basically the transaction record. And in both of these cases, it's odd, so it's a version number. Both of these objects are in a read-only state. And the transaction record basically protects the fields in the object. So in order to access X or Y, you have to go through the transaction record. So let's suppose we have a transaction that's going to copy A into B. Uh, it might look like this. We use an atomic statement to say that we want this to be a transaction. We go ahead and copy one by one the fields X and Y from A to B. Um, what I'm not really showing here is there, there's you know, the, the magic under the hood. It's sort of up to the system or the compiler to figure out that it needs to do some STM operations. So uh, in Java, usually a, what you see is a load is not just a load. Uh, when you do something like A.X, you usually check to see, well, is it null? Uh, is it type safe? And so on. And we can actually just modify that to also say, OK, and inform the STM that I'm reading A.X. Right. So when it reads A.X or writes to B.X, it's going to do some bookkeeping to the STM data structures. Now suppose I have a concurrent thread, thread 2 over there, that's going to uh, read B. And both of these things are executing at the same time. Well, if we get the semantics right, there's only two valid results. Either thread 2 executes first, or appears to execute first, and we read the values 0, 0, or thread 2 executes second, or appears again to execute second, and we read the values 10, 20. If we see a mix of those two things, we've got incorrect, inconsistent behavior. So let's imagine we're actually executing this in an STM. And again, we're going to use this notion of optimistic concurrency and go ahead and execute both of these things at the same time, there's going to be some arbitrary interleaving between these two threads. And again, I mentioned the read set, write set, and undo set. We have these sets for each thread. So I'm going to show how these, how these sets are built up as we execute. So let's imagine thread 2 executes first. Uh, it reads b.x and sees the value 0 over there in b. Um, and when it does it, it also appends to its read set uh, the, the tuple b comma 1. So it's recording what object it's read, and it's recording the current version number of that object, which is 1. Okay. Now let's suppose we start executing a. Uh, same thing, we're doing a read operation. Again, we append the read set with the object a and the version number 7, and the value of temp is 10, as that's the current value. Now when we write to b.x, we need exclusive access of b. Okay, so now we're going to change B from a read-only state to a read-write state. And the owner of B is going to be transaction 1. So we go ahead and overwrite that record uh, uh, slot with a, a pointer to thread 1, basically. And we append the write set with B and the version number it used to be at. And again, we also append the undo log in case we need to abort this transaction. We're going to have to go rewrite B.x with 0. And let's keep going with A here. Um, it's going to read A.Y, which is also going to append to its read set um, and read the value of 20, and write B.Y. Uh, in this last case, B is already locked so, and owned by thread 1, so it doesn't really need to do anything. Uh, but it does need to go ahead and append the undo log again uh, with, uh, with the value 0 in case it needs to abort. And it goes ahead and writes the value 20 in place. And let's suppose this thread goes ahead and finishes, and it tries to commit. Um, so the, again, what I said uh, earlier, this STM is using a, a, an eager mechanism for writes, but a lazy mechanism for reads. And what that lazy mechanism for reads means is that we have to go ahead and validate our read set to prove that this transaction is valid. And all that really consists of is walking through our read set, checking the objects, and making sure that the version number hasn't changed. Now, in this case, we just have A in our read set. And the version number is still 7. So we can go ahead and commit the transaction. And once we do that, we go ahead and install a new version number in B. So uh, the transaction's over. Uh, B is no longer in a write state. It's now back in a read state. But we've incremented the version number uh, by 2, again, because it has to be odd. So let's suppose thread 2 picks up at this point. Uh, of course, again, first we clear the, uh, the read, write, and undo set for th uh, thread 1. So let's suppose thread 2 picks up at this point. 
It goes ahead and reads b.y. Again, it's got to append b and its version number to the read set. And it reads the value 20. And now it tries to go ahead and commit. Now at this point, we have this inconsistent pair 0 and 20. And that's not a valid result as we talked about earlier. And of course, when it goes and tries to validate its read set at this point, it'll see that it's got an entry b comma 1. And b, is no longer ha b no longer has the version number 1. So it has to go ahead and abort this transaction. And, and in this case, let's say it's going to go ahead and restart the transaction. That's the semantics that we want. So in this case now, if it goes ahead and re-executes the transaction, it's going to build up a read set again. And in this case, no conflicts. Um, the read set validates. And we can go ahead and commit this transaction. And we get the values 10 and 20. So that's generally how optimistic concurrency works. Again, there's a lot of sort of variants on STM algorithms. That's just one. But they all have sort of a similar flavor to them in, in some way using a mix of eager and lazy techniques. Um, so now I'm going to talk a bit more about transactions in, uh, in programming languages. So a major value of transactional memory is not really just raw performance or scalability, but really programmability. Um, and what excites a lot of people about transactional memory is that it offers a much simpler programming model compared to locks. For one, it's declarative versus operational. As you saw in our examples, you don't have to say what lock you want to acquire anymore. You just say, this body of code is atomic. Go figure it out. Um, it's also composable in a way that locks aren't. If I just happen to have operations 1 and 2, and I say, I want this to happen as a transaction, I can just wrap atomic around it. I don't have to, again, figure out what lock to, to acquire. And that can be very, very nice if I'm using fine-grained locking. Um, you know, in, in contrast, if I'm using fine-grained locking in operation 1 and operation 2, if I want to compose those together to be a larger atomic operation, it's very hard to do with locks in an efficient way, an efficient, clean way. Um, also, transactions give stronger guarantees that are they're really closer to what programmers really want. Um, when programmers use synchronized, it turns out usually they, they, they want atomic semantics. right? And if they just use transactions from the get-go, they get some nice properties. They'll get deadlock avoidance. Uh, usually programmers don't want to have deadlock in their program. And they also get some of these nice uh, um, atomicity, consistency, isolation um, uh, properties that, that Thorsten mentioned earlier today. And those are the general, the ACI of the ACID properties that, that we have from database transactions. So very quickly, atomicity basically gives us this appearance of instantaneous execution. Right? Either everything happened or nothing happened. Consistency enforces the validity of the memory state. So we sh showed an example of that uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, with consistency, we, we enforce that memory is in one state or another and not in some kind of inconsistent, unexpected state. It also gives us isolation. Uh, it prevents observation of intermediate state by other transactions. And finally, it doesn't actually give us durability. This is usually one thing we give up with uh, memory transactions. Because unlike disk, RAM is really just not intrinsically persistent. So we usually just talk about the ACI properties when we're talking about memory transactions. So here's an example of, of why atomic is easier to use in a language than, say, synchronized. Um, this is kind of a distillation of an uh, uh, earlier version of the string buffer class in the Java cl class library. Um, here we have this append method that takes one buffer and uh, appends it to this buffer. And it's a synchronized operation. And this was actually in basically in a similar form in the class library. Well, it turns out, you can take a look at this code, it's actually not thread safe. And Kind of the key point here is just because I declare something sec synchronized doesn't make it thread safe. So I'll give you guys a moment to see if, you, if the bug pops out at you. Um, yeah, it's actually, you know, something can happen in between some of these operations. So the problem is, Buffer is not locked. Right? If I just declare this method synchronized, it's going to lock the this pointer, but it's not going to lock the parameter that I'm passing in here. So it's perfectly uh, legal for some other thread to go ahead and take a, take a lock on buffer and start changing it right at this point. 
right between when we read the size and when we start copying out of it. Okay? And if that happens, um, another thread uh, can change the size, can do a lot of different things to it. And you know, doing the append may actually lead to uh, inconsistent results or even generate an exception in this code, right? So you would, not accept, you would not expect an exception because you looked at the size, you thought you computed the right size, and you thought you're only accessing valid locations in that buffer. But if it shrunk in the interim, you might get an array out of bounds exception when you do this. Okay. Now if we go ahead and use Atomic, we're basically leaving it up to the implementation to figure out what to protect. And it's going to try to protect everything that's accessed here. So another transaction in this case can't go ahead and alter the parameter that we're passing in. So this code is thread safe. Um, let me go over a couple other sort of things you can get out of having transactions in the language. Um, failure is something that uh, in a locked region can uh, lead to inconsistent state. So if I'm synchronizing, again, this method, let's imagine it's doing a transfer from account one to account two of some amount. Well, I might write the code to you know, basically take amount out of A1 and then append uh, or add in amount into thread two using these set balance and get balance methods. But let's suppose thread uh, A2 is invalid for some reason and one of these second uh, operations throws an exception. Um, if the second statement fails, well, then in this code, we've already gone ahead and executed the first statement. So the amount is still withdrawn from A1. We might throw this exception. And basically, this, this amount value has disappeared into the ether. We're kind of left in this inc inconsistent state. Now, transactions can provide better consistency guarantees to the programmer. Um, under this sort of failure or abort on exception or error semantics, what we'll say is that if the transaction aborts, we're going to go, uh, I'm sorry, if the uh, transaction generates an exception, we're going to go ahead and restore the original state. So the semantics under uh, uh, here is that if we throw this exception on A2, we're going to go ahead and roll A1 back to its initial value. We're already doing this bookkeeping anyway. We might, take it, might as well take advantage of it to provide nice semantics to the programmer. And if this thing throws an exception, basically the transaction really never happened at least as, as far as effects to memory are con considered. And A1 still has its original value. So that can be a nice thing, a nice tool that a programmer can use to make sure that their, their data stays in some sort of a consistent state. That's a good question. Um, I don't think it really makes sense to, well, actually, there's a few different um, semantics you might consider there. Uh, for fa failure animosity. And it's actually a topic of hot debate that what is the proper semantic? Some people think that you should never have failure on exception semantics. You should just go ahead and commit, um, which kind of defeats my argument here. Um, throwing the exception and cascading it out is kind of interesting because if the transaction never occurred, where did this exception object come from, right? Um, and so there is some interesting work there in trying to, to come up with reasonable semantics for that that basically lets you expose the exception but still go ahead and roll back the values that happened. And there the semantics might be that some type of exception object is still propagated out. Yes? Um, yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, another problem with locks is that they don't really protect us very well from uh, malicious or uh, uh, buggy data races. So for example, let's suppose I have this lock-based code here. Um, I check whether A is not null, and I go ahead and return A.x. So a quick question, can this code ever throw a null pointer exception? And, and go, why? Absolutely, right? So very simple. Another thread could go ahead and alter A between this point and this point, and just set A equal to null. Right. It doesn't have to acquire the lock. It's a bug. Or maybe it's even worse. It's some sort of malicious code that someone has figured out how to run and perfectly interleave with, with your thread here. Um, so the answer is yes. Uh, and this is actually a common security exploit. I've been told by my friends in the systems uh, community. It's called a time to check to time to use or tuck to, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, exploit. 
uh, and it's commonly used. Uh, it's basically exploit a data race somewhere in the code to generate some sort of unexpected behavior that the programmer never anticipated, right? And so you can generate an exception. That exception will cause some behavior that perhaps the original programmer didn't anticipate and lead to other sort of security holes in the program. Now transactions in this case can actually provide more secure behavior. Um, under strong isolation, um, a transactional memory implementation will prevent another thread from violating the isolation of this code. So this thing is really guaranteed to be atomic. No other thread can interfere with it. And in this case, uh, the null pointer exception cannot be thrown. Another, a non-transactional uh, thread, let's see, this should say that under strong isolation, a non-transactional thread cannot interfere with a transaction. So this is a nice property to have. I can just throw atomic around something. And I can just reason about it locally. So since I know this is a transaction, I know it's never going to throw a null pointer exception. I don't have to worry about carefully checking all the other parts of my program to make sure that they play nicely with this. So um, some obstacles to, to transactional memory. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of implementation challenges. As I said, the current state of hardware uh, transactional memory is pretty modest. Um, current and forthcoming hardware support pretty limited transactions. And we'd really like some sort of hardware support to make this thing work efficiently. Um, STM, on the other hand, gives us really nice semantics to play with. But there's some performance uh, challenges. There's some overhead if you're doing this bookkeeping on reads and writes. And, and people will work pretty hard to, to really you know, get this down from a factor of, say, 10 to now really just 20% or 30%. So it might be actually viable in certain situations. But large transactions are also problematic for a couple reasons. If you have large transactions, these read-write sets get fairly large and have their own cache footprint that can hurt performance. And also, the larger your transaction is, I mean, the, the bigger you are, the harder you fall. The larger tr your transaction is, the more expensive it is to abort it, right? The more wasted work you have. There's also some interesting semantic challenges. Um, you know, Brad's question kind of touched on the semantics of exceptions, right? And that's still something that people are arguing about. We're still trying to figure out what, what it means to have I.O. or other operations that can't be rolled back inside of a transaction. There's some interesting uh, work going on there. And also, conflicts between transactional and non-transactional accesses are kind of problematic. Um, I talked about strong isolation, but not all STMs provide that. Uh, you can kind of think of this as a difference between um, memory and databases. It's as if you had you know, a database that's writing to a file system and someone on the side that's basically directly editing the files underneath. Uh, with an STM, you know, what if you don't use Atomic to go ahead and read and write your memory? Should it go ahead and be allowed to, to do anything to it? Um, so there's still kind of a lot of questions to work out there in terms of what the right semantics are. Uh, so here's a kind of a general summary. Uh, transactions, hopefully I've argued that they are an attractive alternative to locks. Uh, they do give us a simpler programming model with stronger guarantees. And they potentially give us better scalability in certain cases with optimistic concurrency. There's a lot of research and development that's still kind of needed in this area. We need to understand uh, performance for general transactions and provide good, uh, understandable performance to programmers that, uh, that they can go ahead and debug and have all these tools for. We need to formalize the semantics of this. And, uh, and actually, one of the best resources to find out more about this is, is the Wikipedia entry, which is pretty frequently updated these days with lots of different STMs you could download and play around with. And, probably find out the, the latest and greatest in terms of hardware as well. So that's it. Be happy to take any questions.